Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Edouard, for inviting me. And I'm very honored to be here. And I appreciate that uh, I'm the only one who has to speak to you in English and that you're willing to listen to me nevertheless. What unites Mark Twain, Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein, and Yogi Berra? Yogi Berra is an American baseball player. Well, they all are quoted as having said, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. We don't know whether any one of them really said that, except for Yogi Berra, he did. <clears throat> so predictions are difficult, and they're even more difficult if we are thinking of predictions for a faraway future, a future that allows outside the, the time horizon we as humans experience. And of course, this is why I'm mentioning it. Uh, if we are speaking about predictions about climate change till the end of the century, that lies far away uh, from, from the usual time scales that we are normally thinking about. So looking so far into the future, <clears throat> We have to use climate models, and it is crucial that we understand what these models are capable of and what their limitations are. So these are the two points I would like to talk to you about. One, when we look into the future, when we make predictions for the future, what are the key uncertainties in these predictions? And the second point, uh, what is the role of climate variability? And I will explain a bit what, what I mean by that in looking at, um, a few, at a future climate. Edouard showed you this figure. This is from the current generation of global climate models. Uh, the predictions, or sometimes you say projections, uh, of future warming. It is, let me see if I can, um, relative to, to a period from uh, 1986 to 2005, and it's uh, so the amount of global average warming that we expect for an uh, out to year 2100. Just for reference, um, this period, 1986 to 2005, was about 0.6 degrees centigrade warmer than the pre-industrial period. Just this is important because in terms of political discussions and negotiations, we talk about limiting global warming to two degrees. So because those two degrees are relative to uh, the pre-industrial period, this year is relative to the period 1986 through 2005. Uh, you have to add the 0.6 degrees to the scale here if you want to convert it to the, to the, to the discussions about the two degree limit. So uh, this is what the models are giving up. These numbers are the number of models that have participated in that comparison. And if you look at the overall range of possible warming, the result is extremely sobering. The lower end here is 0.5 degrees compared to that period. The upper end is 5.5 degrees, 10 times as much. So the difference between neg negligible impact and very, very large impact. So you'll be forgiven for asking, do we know anything at all? 0.5 to 5.5? I mean, isn't that too huge a, a range to be useful? Well, we do know something, but it is necessary that we take a step back and ask ourselves, how do we deconstruct these curves? Where do, do these numbers come from? They're based on climate models. Um, and what do climate models do? First and foremost, they represent mathematically and physically the most important processes in the atmosphere, in the ocean, on the land surface, and sea ice. These processes are written as equations, and the equations are then solved on the biggest computers we have available to us. The essential part, the, the, the fundamental part of the models uh, is based on the laws of nature that are beyond any doubt. Conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, Newton's second law. That is something we know we have great confidence in, we have absolute confidence in. There are other parts of the models where we have to make assumptions. For example, cloud processes, um, turbulence. There are aspects of these models where we don't have 
fundamental laws of nature that allow us to formulate equations. And on these parts, we have to make assumptions. These assumptions are plausible, but they cannot be proven right. So there is some uncertainty about these assumptions. In different models, different modeling groups made different assumptions about uh, uh, that go into the models, and because of the different uh, of assumptions, the results are different. So what we have here is essentially from these plausible but unproven and unprovable assumptions, we have what we call a model uncertainty. Different models give different results, um, and uh, that is a minimum uh, measure of uncertainty. But there's another level of uncertainty, and that uh, comes to the scenarios. Um, the scenarios that enter these simulations are assumptions about which decisions humanity, society, will make now and in the future concerning economic behavioral choices that have an impact, that have a bearing on the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And the two particular sets of assumptions, or, or the two particular assumed set of choices that entered here, are the two scenarios which go under the wonderfully um, awkward names of RCP and a number, representative concentration pathways. The reason why I use it is that that's the name and that's what's used in all, all the climate change debate right now. They are not, not by any way beautiful names uh, that are easy to communicate. But in brief, the two scenarios that, that I've shown here, that I've used, is one, the RCP 8.5. It says no climate mitigation whatsoever. Uh, we just keep increasing the greenhouse gas concentrations, especially the carbon dioxide concentrations. The other scenario is 2.6. It assumes that there are very, very effective greenhouse gas uh, climate mitigation measures, very quick and effective reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, such that we have a chance of, of uh, meeting the two degree target of uh, limiting global warming to two degrees or less. Now, the point is we cannot predict which of the two or what the decisions humanity will take. We cannot predict whether humanity will decide more in the direction of 8.5, no mitigation measures, or more in the direction of 2.6. That's just not possible. It is not possible to predict the behavior of human society. So at least currently, it is not possible. So this is a scenario uncertainty. We don't know uh, which paths uh, humanity will choose in the future. So we have the two different sets of uncertainty. and. The scenarios enter as input, uh, the, the emissions enter as input, the climate model simulations. And then we can go back and look again at the curves I showed you. This is now only for the scenario 8.5, so we, we, we no mitigation measures. And still, so for one set of decisions, we still have a range of answers. And now comes in the model uncertainty. This is for models with a high climate sensitivity. Climate sensitivity tells you how much warm you get for an increase in CO2 concentration. This is for models with a low climate sensitivity. So this range here is the model uncertainty. And we don't know which of these models is right, if any. But so we get a range here from between around 3 degrees to 5.5 degrees. Under this scenario is a range of uh, model uncertainty. It, it, it shows the limits of our physical understanding. We can do the same for the other scenario. Now, that's another assumed set of choices humanity will take. And again, we have high climate sensitivity more at the upper end, more like a bit below 2 degrees, or the low below 1.5 one, one degree. So that is the modeling uncertainty. And so we have this combination of uncertainty that A, the difference between the two curves, which is the question, which decisions will we make throughout the century? And the second is the range within each of the curve, the shadings here. Um, what is the modeling uncertainty? What is the limit of our understanding of the climate system? And one other point, Edouard mentioned that those shadings here, so the curves and their uncertainty, they overlap quite a bit till around 
2050. And that means, which is a sobering aspect, and we'll come back to that, that means for a few decades, quite some decades, we won't notice the difference. Even if we take very efficient, very effective mitigation measures in terms of temperature, we won't really know the difference because the curves are so close to each other. Another point I want to make here is that in the RCP 2.6, in this scenario, there is no further warming uh, after around 2050. Whereas here, of course, the warming goes on and on and on. But the second point in uh, 2.6, there is no further warming beyond 2050. This picture changes if we look at sea level rise. It's for the same scenarios, for the same types of models, and the meaning is the same. This is the shading. Uh, the shading is uh, the different models, something I never said, but I should have said the line is always the average over all models for the two scenarios. And what we see is by sea level, the overlap goes on between the models, goes on till the end of the century. So in sea level, it is much harder to see success if you ask we worked so hard to mitigate climate change, can we see it? And the answer is, well, in sea level it's harder to see than it is in temperature, which is another sobering thought. The other point is that even in this very optimistic scenario where the temperature rise stabilizes by the end of the century, actually past 2050, sea level keeps going up and up and up, even in this very, very optimistic scenario. So we are already locked in to sea level rise that go, will go on for centuries. So the sea level is the elephant in the climate system. It never forgets for centuries. What are the limitations in our climate models? We have a problem, we have a fundamental philosophical problem when we look at climate modeling, and especially if we look at the predictions till the end of the century. And that is the standard scientific method says, okay, we make a theoretical prediction, we evaluate against measurements, observations, and if the prediction is wrong, we got to discard the, the theory or we got to modify the theory, however you want to call it. With century long predictions, we cannot do that. <clears throat> we can't afford to wait. Well, as individuals, we can't. We'll be dead by the time the, the prediction can be checked. But also, if there is a societally relevant point, we can't afford to wait uh, until we know whether the predictions have been correct. And even if you could afford to wait, uh, there, there's a problem that these scenarios are simplified. The real, real set of decisions humanity will take will be different from what's in, embodied in the scenarios. And uh, so uh, if we do test in year 2100 or check in 2100, and we say, well, but the, the emissions, uh, the evolution of emissions was different than what we assumed 100 years ago. What does that mean for our evaluation? So we're in a, in a, in a difficult uh, situation, unlike in weather forecasting, where day after day after day after day, the real weather that happens tells you whether your forecast was good or bad. We still have reason to be confident in some basic elements of the climate models. And one is uh, the point I mentioned already. The essence, the basis of our models is a fundamental law of nature, uh, fundamental laws of nature. And there's just no reason at all to doubt any of these conservation of mass energy momentum. Second is that ever since models were developed, uh, researchers have, have evaluated the models. Of course, not with respect to the future, but with respect to the past. Have they been able to simulate what we observe, what we have been able to observe over the decades? And so there have been hundreds and thousands of tests that the model have been exposed to, and the models have passed a lot of these tests that they could have failed, but they didn't fail. They passed them. Now, that is no proof, of course, that the models give us the right answer for the future, but it builds up some confidence in the, in the models, There's some, some confirmation of what's embodied in the models. And third, there is some very basic, very fundamental understanding of why the models do what they do, that we have. And it is, may, maybe to, to many researchers, this is the deepest reason for having confidence. We just understand why the models do what they do. Some of the of things that go into them, 
the basic greenhouse effect. A triatomic gas absorbs and re-emits long-wave radiation. Sea level rise that comes from ocean warming, uh, ocean acidification that comes from CO2 uptake. These things are so well understood and so simple in their essence that we have this basic understanding of why the models do what they do. And that aids greatly in our confidence in what in some of what in much of what the models tell us. There are other things where we are much less confident, but we also begin to understand better and better why we have to be less confident. Our second point, climate variability, um, I would ask you to join me in a thought experiment that uh, imagine that the conference at COP21 would be a huge success. So after 2020, which is the time horizon for when the measures should uh, take hold, uh, the emissions uh, don't, don't rise as fast as they did before, or they even begin to fall. And then 20 years hence, uh, think of two possibilities. The first possibility is temperature has indeed risen less fast than it has before, so the warming has slowed down. Um, does that mean, great, our mitigation efforts worked, we can all clap ourselves on our collective shoulders and say, this was worth it, the effort was worth it. That's one possibility. Let's look at the other possibility global surface temperature has risen faster than it did before, despite the mitigation measures. Does that mean this has all been wrong? Does that mean the foundation of what we're doing, we have to curb CO2 emissions, does it mean uh, this has all been wrong? What do we do, faced with either of the two? Now, it's clear to see this year will not be dramatic. This would be dramatic if this happened. What do we do? This would be one of the surprises your director spoke of. Now, I would maintain both interpretations would be wrong. Why would they both be wrong? Because of climate variability. Climate varies just on its own. And in order to understand, in order to prepare ourselves for this possible surprise, let us look at the past 15 to 20 years. It holds a lesson for us to learn if we apply Fundamental research to the past 20 years, it holds a lesson to prepare for this possible surprise in the future. This is just, just the, the record of global average temperature over the last 150, well, 65 years. And uh, we had this long-term warming since around 1900 and also most, no, no, most uh, pronounced since 1950. Uh, this is mostly anthropogenic, human-made, uh, but on top of the long-term warming, we have these fluctuations. Temperature goes up, down, up, and down by around 0.2 degrees year to year. And if we home in on the last 15 years, this is a period 19, um, 1990 or so to 2000, no, 1980, sorry, to 2012, we have this plateau which uh, has uh, create, uh, created so much attention and many papers recently sometimes called the warming hiatus or the warming slowdown. And uh, the slowdown has been characterized by a reduction in trend uh, from 0.11 degrees per decade over the long-term period to 0.04 degrees per decade over the last 15 years. So remember, this is a scenario I posed before, but just opposite, like I asked, okay, the trend, the 15-year temperature change is either less or, or greater than what we had uh, over, over the decades before. And now, to add to that, uh, let us look again at the past 15 years. This is what models have been, do have been doing. Red are the different sets of observations, one of them I showed you before. The individual colors are individual model simulations for the past 60 years and the black is the, the average over all available models. And what we've seen is here, and this is part of the discussion we've had, the models had done very well in simulating the warming over the past 60 years, but they did not do well in simulating the warming hiatus. The models kept increasing the temperatures. So that, that gave raise to this enormous debate about whether the models were all wrong. And now again, back to our thought experiment. In the last 15 to 20 years, the models have been warming more than the observations. In our thought experiment, we might find the opposites. 
temperatures keep rising, but the model said because of the less rising CO2 concentration, the warming should be less. So it would be quite the same type of discussion potentially, just with an opposite science. In the last 20 years, the models will warm faster than observations, but in my thought experiments, the models warm less. What do we do? What does that tell us? What does that tell us about the models? What does that tell us about our political efforts? And the answer is very little. And this is something that a colleague and friend of mine, Piers Foss, and I published earlier this year. And it's a bit uh, abstract, so please let me, walk, let me walk you through. We were talking about temperature trends, about uh, the change over any given 15-year period, and we measured that in degrees per decade. And what we've shown, what we've done here, everyone focused on this last point. The circles are the observations. Everyone had focused on the period 1998 to 2012 and compared models and, ob and observations. And we said, well, this is wrong. We have good reason to believe that chance, coincidence, randomness, stochasticity, chaos play a role. So we got to look at the entire period. We got to look at all the trends. So we looked at all 15-year trends since the beginning of the 20th century. And so this is the black circles. And then the shading tells us how often do the climate models that we have show a trend of a particular magnitude at a particular time. So whenever it's dark, it means many models show for this dark year of a 15-year period, they show a trend of a certain magnitude. And we'll do that year after year after year after year and just count how often the models show, show a trend of the magnitude. And because we look at the, at the observations and the models, you can see sometimes the observations warm faster than practically all the models, sometimes they warm less than practically all the models. By and large, and we quantified that in the paper, there is no pattern really. Sometimes the, the models lie above the observations, sometimes they lie below, sometimes the observations lie in the middle. And we also have a reason, like it's impossible to go here, in here in the, in the brevity uh, uh, that the talk must have. So uh, because because that the, the observations just jump up and down vis-a-vis -vis the models where they are, tells us that really the 15-year trends, the change of temperature over 15 years, totally dominated by climate variability, by quasi-random effects. And one thing we showed in the paper that uh, the difference between forcing, say the different models have different forcing, volcanic forcing, anthropogenic, uh, uh, CO2 forcing and so on, the way they are driven. The difference between the four forcings plays a negligible role over 15 years, and so does the climate sensitivity. We cannot tell sensitive from less sensitive models if we only look at 15-year periods. All these factors play no role for these 15 years. And so coming back to, to the thought experiment, it means that... Um, it's again a 15-year period, and we, so we take mitigation measures and we look at temperature and, tell, and ask what does the temperature rise tell or change tell us about the effectiveness of mitigation measures, or maybe about the sensitivity of the models. Based on our experience from the recent past, the answer is the temperature record will tell us nothing. And that is really important to know. It's all, over 15 years, it's all dominated by internal variability. So, to summarize, we have the two key uncertainties when we look at, when we project, predict warming in the 21st century. One is that we don't know how societies will decide about economic activity and CO2 emissions. This is something we can influence, of course, as citizens and through our personal behavior. In principle, we, the society, we, humanity, influence the decisions we make. Well, we make the decisions, so we can influence it, but unfortunately we cannot predict it. There's the other uncertainty. We don't know what Earth's climate sensitivity is. There's still, widely, still a large range of uncertainty, so how much warming do we get for a given amount of emissions? That is something that we will know better in the future. We cannot influence it. Earth has a sensitivity it has, has a sensitivity it has. So, one thing we can influence, but we can't predict. The other, we, we can know better, but we can't influence it. Then, I made this point about short-term trends, 15-year trends, that they are largely determined by variability, so not by changes in forcing. 
not by climate sensitivity. And this means really in terms of the advisory role we as researchers have to governments and the society, this is a case of much needed expectation management. In 2035, by just looking at global temperature, global temperature change, we will not be able to diagnose the success or otherwise of mitigation measures. It's just not possible. And I think we as scientists had better prepare for that. We had better prepare for the questions that come. Do we see the success? If not, why not? And why didn't you tell us 20 years ago? And with this, I thank for your attention. Thank you.